If you want to learn how you can turn yourself in from a poor peasant to the kingdom of Calradia, just with a few sticks, mud, and some blacksmith hammers here, I'll show you how. Follow me. So welcome back everybody, today we're going to try something different here, and I'm actually going to show you how to make money in this lovely yield game here called Bannerlord here. Now look at its predecessors in Warband, the way to actually make money in this game is a bit different than its predecessors. So let's go over a few things that you can do, at least in the mid game and the early game itself. So first things first, what can you do in early game? Well, there's a couple of things that you can do here. Generally, you're going to be sticking to roughly around four main things. That is trading, that is dealing with looters or other sort of bandit parties, questing and smithing itself here. Now, trading, pretty self-explanatory. You buy one item for a cheap price, you sell it for a later price here. Now, there's an interesting mechanic in this game in that you don't have to actually write down each individual, you know, name or the actual price you bought it for. Instead, this game kind of keeps track of it for you. So when you actually go buy something, you actually notice that if something is a very low value, or at least is an incredibly cheap to buy at the moment, it'll be listed as a green item or red if it's extremely overpriced. So what that means, you can buy that cheaply, sell it to an area where the price is turned red, and you know that means that area is demanding a whole lot of it, but doesn't have a whole lot of supply. So there you go, you can sell for a large amount of money. This also applies to a variety of other things, like horses too. Horses are a fabulous way to make money in Bannerlord. For example, I go around the Batania, Sturgeon, and Valadian section of the game, and there you can actually find a whole slew of money just selling mules and stumper horses between some of the major horse producing areas. If you go a little bit north to Sturgeon area, you can sell it for a big sum of money. Go down to Valadian area, you can sell it for like $150 per mule or stumper horse, depending on the city. So you can make a lot of money from that. The downside when it comes to horses is that you generally do not want to have like a 200, 300 horses in your inventory unless you have a substantially large army. So you can only really get horses up until the point of how many troops you have. So this is one of the few areas where if you had a bunch of just random recruits running around here uh, managing all your horses, that actually could be a way you can make money. So even having an army of like 150 uh, recruits could actually be useful if you just use them to pal around with all your horses. This also applies to things like war mounts or non-carrying capacity horses, because stumpers and mules, they have extra carrying capacity, 100 per unit. But the regular mounts that you just use for riding around and upgrading your troops, those really only roughly around 10 or so. But you can still sell those for the great profit, like you get the Britannian pony and there's 30 ponies. You go to an area where they don't have a whole lot, you can sell it there for maybe 100 or so coins more. So it's actually a really great profit, downside very high upfront cost. And of course, there's always just using trade goods too. Try and method of buying up trade goods in one area where they're produced, but go into a distant city where they're not produced at all, and congratulations, make a bunch of money there. And once you actually start finding a few areas that actually have pretty sustainable profits that you can make, it's a pretty good idea at that point just to make a little caravan loop from that. And you generally want to make it a loop pretty large in the sense if you want to go from one city, go to this city, go to that city, go to that city, go to that city. So it's a large enough loop so that the markets actually have time to adjust to all the supply that you dump in there. Because if you go into an area and you just dump all of your supplies, it'll actually take time for the city to burn through all the supplies a couple of days or so. So keep working on that. Not to mention too, there's generally the habit of people just selling off everything immediately once they get a first area profit. Don't do that. Only sell the amount of items you get. Because if you sell to a city, the uh, value of the item actually gradually goes down. So actually only decrease it to the point where you're still making profit. So say if I bought clay at $10 a piece and there's an area where I can sell it for 20 I'd reasonably sell it down to roughly around the 15 dinar range so that I can go to the next city where I can sell it for 20 or 30 and still buy it down to 15 there. So you're not just continuously lowering and lowering your profit margins, increasing the amount of work you have to do. That is unless they actually have an item at the city itself that's actually worth a decent chunk of money and you know that you can sell it later on. Then at that point, yeah, it's worth it just to trade at that point. Another big thing, looter parties or bandit parties in general. Early on, you're going to find plenty of these bandit parties here that are maybe in between the 1 to 20 people range here. If you're skilled enough, you can actually take these on just by yourself. Get yourself a blunt weapon and a horse and just thwack them all down. And congratulations, you get yourself a bunch of free money. Or if you're a very skilled archer, you can do that too. Another method is to actually shoot them, uh, retreat, go back at them, and continuously do that because you actually refill your arrows every time you retreat. Although it actually may uh, mess up the amount of rewards you get. But that is one thing you can do. Generally, the highest quality looters are going to be the ones of the Sea Raiders variety. And then I would say a close second are probably going to be the Forest Bandits or any of the Step Bandits, maybe Mountain Bandits too. 
and then the absolute cheapest will be the looter party, but they're the easiest and least threatening that you can do, and those are the ones you're probably going to go after the most for early game money. And a nice synergistic thing you can do with that is that any of the weapons that you get from looter parties, you can actually smelt down into smithing and then use that to create new weapons, although that requires a lot of time waiting. Or you can just use a mod. Next thing you can do, questing. Absolutely fabulous thing to do early on because depending on the quest you can get, it can require either no upfront investment or very minimal upfront investment. So a lot of the quests I like to do are a little bit harder. These would be the caravan ambush quest and the extortion quest that you can do in towns. These will actually require you to have a decent party of roughly around 50 people to at least do successfully. But if you can do these, you can actually earn a decent chunk of money. Any ambush quest, congratulations, not only did you get all the loot from the prisoners and the people actually charging you, you get all the loot from the gear, the weapons, whatever, you can get all that good stuff. But then if you actually wait until the caravan itself is attacked and then you assist the caravan, congratulations, the caravan will thank you and give you free money. However, if you attack the deserters before they get to the caravan, you don't get the money, but you do get the cross reward. So in that way, you get the rewards from killing them, you get the actual rewards from the caravan, and you get the quest money reward for completing the quest. So it's a great way to earn a bunch of money early on. And there's a lot of quests like that. So go around, see if you have a quest there, experiment it, talk with it, see what you need to do. There's also going to be quests such as the Art of the Deal. I recommend avoiding these quests because these quests, for whatever reason, if you actually hand calculate out what each item will individually cost, say you'll buy like 150 loads of salt for 4,000 dinars, and it's like, okay, let me calculate this out. It's like $42 per. What? What? It's a lot of money. Not to mention, too, the village itself is selling it for like $8 a bag of salt. So I'd make sure to actually check about those Art of the Deal quests. Those are really only going to be useful if you want to increase your relationship. It only increases it by one, so it's not really that worth it. But keep that in mind. There's also going to be the rogue quest that you also get the opportunity to do, such as gang leader needs weapons or bandits or fencing stolen goods or... You know, X, Y, or Z thing. Generally, you don't want to do these quests because they come at a very high relationship penalty or criminality penalty with a known faction. So it's not really the best of ideas there because eventually you may get caught and you may end up losing a bunch of your money and late game comes around here. You don't want to be at war with the faction a whole bunch. So when it actually comes to questing here, I'd make sure to actually try it. You're probably going to do a little bit of save scumming initially just to figure out what quests are worthwhile to do, which ones are worth to avoid. Because this game is currently still in active development, so any of the quests I mentioned here could very well likely be reworked and no longer be profitable, much more intensive, or just no longer worth your time. So I'd make sure just to save scum here a couple of times, be like, okay, what's the reward for this? What's the penalty? Let me figure this out real quickly. Okay, now do I actually want to do this quest? And there you go. You're going to have to kind of do that. This is one of those games where you just can't simply skate by a lot of the time. Next thing here for the early game here is smithing. Now this is a new system brought in in Bannerlord in which you can actually create a variety of weapons for yourself depending if you have the materials, the skill, and what not to actually do it. And depending on your level of skill you can either have a higher quality blade, a lower quality blade, or even a legendary quality blade if you're that advanced in smithing. Now the downside with smithing is that in order for you to actually smith a weapon, refine a resource, or do anything with it, you will have to either find the blueprints A, find the materials B, or do something else Plus, you have to manage a stamina smithing, or a smithing stamina system, sorry about that, in which you actually have to rest, click the wait here for some time at a village or a town, and that's the only way you can recuperate it besides using mods. But smithing has an absolutely phenomenal return on investment here. It is insane the amount of money you can work on it. Smithing is broken to the nth degree. I mean, if you have 15 companions, or, well, more realistically, if you have four or five companions with you, or if you do the storyline and you have your brother, your sister, and your bro- uh, sorry, your little brother, your little sister, and your brother, you can earn a lot of money from it. So that right there, that's three companions, plus whatever you can get from being a tier 4, a tier 5 clan, congratulations, you can have a lot of companions, and when you do this, you can earn some really good money. Making any sort of weapon can actually generally return you a profit, but the higher quality of the weapon, the higher quality materials you use, and the higher quality of the blade, you generally get more and more money. Now that being said, there are a few weapons that you tend to avoid, but that kind of changes depending on the balancing of the game. Like it used to be recommended that you just make javelins, because javelins would give you roughly around a $100,000 weapon for a single piece of wrought iron and a single piece of hardwood. Uh, but that's been nerfed now, they only give you like maybe 75, so they're not really worth it anymore to do it. However, then you can make the two-handed mace, which is just a giant piece of wood on a very long stick. And yet, for some reason, that's worth $2,000 per, and you can make five of them a day per companion. 
So if you have a lot of companions, congratulations, you can make upwards of 20 grand a day just making hammers. What? <laughs> so experiment with it. It also depends on what blueprints you have available. Those you get by either smelting weapons and smelting higher quality weapons tend to give you more blueprints. And it also just depends on the level of the characters. So the more time you invest in smithing, the more you can actually get out of it and a lot of money you can earn. Especially considering that smithing does not require you to have a standing army at all, unless you're going between cities to sell off items because you've made too many or you need more materials, then you may need an army just to transport resources. But in that case, you can earn a lot of money just by doing that. And if you do it prior to having a kingdom before you're actually getting wars declared against you, it's an absolutely fabulous way to make money without any issue. Downside, it is extremely boring, and it actually may kind of feel like cheating at some time, so do it with a grain of salt. And if you actually need more campaigns to do it, there's going to be a whole separate thing on that later on. But generally, just go around, try to find as many companions as you can find easily. Any companion will do for smithing, but you can try to find the specific smithing companions, although I'm not quite sure where they respawn, and they're a bit random, so I wouldn't heavily rely on them, but they do exist if you're trying to hold out for them. So if you ever find one, quickly kick someone out of your party, invite the smith in, and start working from there is an excellent idea if you want to make a bunch of money too. And if you want more companions too, you can try to have a, a wife or a husband in the party, as well as just your marrying off your brothers or any male relatives in your family, because if you have a male uh, married off, you actually get the female into your clan, so you can actually expand your clan just by marrying off the people. Who the hell follows a channel in the middle of the night? I should really turn that off. Now I completely lost what I was going to say. My god. But yeah, either way, when you marry off a male relative, you get the female person back into your clan. So try to keep the females and marry off the males, and you get more people into your clan. Plus, if you have your uh, wife or husband in your party, congratulations, you create a bunch of kids, and then after a while, there you go. You got a lot more people in your clan. So great way to expand your smithing opportunities, as well as just to expand the amount of people in your clan in general. Great tip. Now we finally get to the mid game. Wow, it has felt like 30 minutes already in, a, in this single take. <laughs> but mid game here. Now we're going to be moving on to things that are going to be more common to those people who would like to progress more to the mid and late game section. And this is going to be dealing with caravans and workshops. Now caravans, what are caravans? Well, they're actually just little parties that roam around their map selling items and then giving whatever profit back to you. Now generally these are going to be led by either your clan mates or they're going to be led by the wanderers that you find in taverns. Now in this section, having a person who is a great leader or a great tradesman will actually help out massively when it comes to caravan, because that just increases the amount of profit they earn while trading. And there's also going to be two types of caravans. There's a basic caravan that costs 15,000 dinars, and there's a second tier of caravan, although I'm not quite sure what the price on that is. It's either like the 26 or 30,000 range uh, for that second tier of caravan. But that second tier of caravan is way stronger and resists looting way more often. So it's actually quite nice if you want to prevent your caravans from getting snatched up by looters. So generally try to go for the higher tier caravan if you can afford it. And generally why I say this is mid game, because the thing is, is that you're actually going to be losing followers if you make caravans, but they also return a consistent and nice uh, return on profits. Generally even more so than what you'd find in workshops, especially if you have high quality trading followers. Plus it also allows your followers to train up in a variety of skills from scouting, athletics, riding, trading, charm, scouting, you know, just the whole nine yards. It allows them to actually be trained up quite nicely. And it doesn't really matter where you start your clan at because, or rather, it doesn't really matter where you start off your caravans because the caravans will just roam around the entire map at any given point in time. So that actually makes it doubly important that you get the very expensive caravans just because if the caravan gets attacked and destroyed, well, congratulations, if the caravan died halfway across the map, then you may have to go halfway across the map to find them. Not to mention there's also the chance if you have enabled birth and death for the character to die. So keep that in mind. Next thing, workshops. These are pretty interesting here. So if you actually go into any major city, go to any of the carpenters, you know, any place that has like a workshop of some sort, be it smithy, silversmith, uh, wood shop, granary, or whatever shop you find inside of a city that you can find by holding down the alt key while inside a city, you can go there, ask the shop worker, they'll generally ask you for roughly around thirteen to fifteen thousand dollars dinar or sorry, dinars to actually purchase the workshop, and from there you get to choose whatever you want to actually make the item make money for you. Now, workshops are a bit interesting here in the sense that you have to go around to each individual city there, go to a particular workshop, it being smithy, silversmith, workshop, granary, brewery, whatever you may be. You can find those by pressing the alt key and just looking for whatever business is available. You go to the people, ask to buy the workshop. It's generally between 13,000 and 15,000 dinars here. Now, the thing with the workshops is that the profit of a workshop is not really consistent. It depends on the supply of the item 
uh, that you need the raw material like grain or iron or wood or whatever you may need be and then whatever the value of the item that can be exported such as tools or bows or leather or whatever product is being made now in order for you to actually know what profit will be it's kind of a crap shot here the only way you can actually really find out what the most profitable item at any given moment is is generally just by saves coming in the sense that you save before you enter a city you enter a city you talk with a shop worker you buy the item and then you just go down the list of whatever item you can find wait a day see what's profitable and then reload the game and then just pick that item straight out of the list it used to be that like biking conquest for instance that you could actually ask the person uh what the most profitable item or workshop would be and they would tell you just straight up but in this game they don't really tell you which is kind of unfortunate so the only way you can kind of do it is either a if you have mods or b just do the save scum method Downside, it's going to take you a lot of time. Upside, though, workshops never face the issue of getting attacked by looters. However, if you ever go to war with a faction, you may lose access to that workshop entirely. So the way you can kind of circumvent this is by proposing an alliance with the leader of the faction through marriage. So from previously, when we talked about smithing and trying to expand your clan, if you actually expand your clan in the area where you're going to be predominantly at a lot of the time, that is a great way to earn a bunch of extra worry-free mentality. So say I can marry off, you know, someone to Ragnavid of the Sturgeons, get myself a lovely, lovely uh, clanmate back, and then now I can actually set up all my workshops in the various cities there, and I should be safe uh, from losing those workshop investments. Because if you do to go war with them, you generally do lose your workshop and you have to reset it up again once you, you know, are no longer at war. Or if you ally with a faction that has a decent workshop or you're going to be with them a very long time, then yeah, go ahead and just dump your workshops down there uh, with whatever faction you allied with, and congratulations, you'll be set. Now this also is going to matter too, make sure you don't have a high criminality rating with any of these factions, because it could potentially get you in trouble, and you may lose your workshops. But alright, I think I've talked long enough here about early game and mid game, hopefully this provides you a lot of tips on what you can actually do here to make some money here. Sorry if it can't be too hyper-specific, because the issue is this game is currently in active development, so any hyper-specifics to get about particular skills to acquire or particular routes to go down may not even exist in whatever version of the game that you may be playing down a year down the line. Like I said, this game is changing quite a lot here, so actually making, you know, recommendations like that would be impossible. But general principles here, plot into the game, you'll make some money. Absolutely! You'll earn some dosh. Now, we could talk about late game later on, but the issue, like I said, there's a lot of things involved with kingdom management, towns, taxes, policies, what to build first, how to manage garrisons, things like that down the line you're going to have to worry about later on. So that'll be a separate video, especially considering that uh, I'm going to need to prior footage of that too. <laughs> but other than that, guys, I want to thank you all for joining this evening. Yeah, have fun following the platform. It's your favorite. Run that YouTube, run that Twitch, run that Twitter, run that Discord. Other than that, feel free to join this channel for a lovely, lovely membership of only one dollar. Get yourself free emotes and access to lovely, lovely stream emotes too. Other than that, guys, I want to thank you all for joining this evening. Love anything, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye.